just so everybody knows that we're recording. And then what I'm going to ask you to do is put your questions in the chat box, which is the little, uh, you should see a little cartoon talk bubble somewhere. And put your questions there. And towards the end, I'll get around to uh, asking you to uh, talk and give your questions. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll do my best to answer them. So uh, first of all, thanks for coming. I, I hope this is helpful to everybody. I just like doing this and uh, hopefully you'll all learn from my mistakes and from the many mistakes that I've seen others make so that you don't have to repeat those mistakes yourself. There we go, there's, uh, there's another picture of me, but just to get some background, I think it's important always to understand who you're talking to or who's giving the presentation. So there's me, I'm the president of Zeidman Consulting. Uh, it used to be a one-man shop that, that designed hardware and software, but now we mostly, it's, it's a network of people around the country that consult on intellectual property litigation from an engineering point of view. So if companies are suing over patents or copyrights, they'll hire us to take, uh, take equipment apart to reverse engineer software and to figure out who stole what from whom, if, if that happened at all. Uh, I've developed some software to help with that. It's called Code Suite. Uh, my clients have included Apple, Cisco, Facebook, and a number of startups. You know, I work for large companies and also small companies uh, in litigation, helping them with litigation. We're usually brought in by the attorneys. I've written a book on software intellectual property and how to detect copying and infringement. It's called the Software IP Detectives Handbook, and a lot of articles uh, and papers on engineering and business. I'm the named inventor on 23 patents. Uh, I'm hoping that will be 25, uh, not too long from now. And I have degrees from Cornell. I did my undergraduate at Cornell and did my graduate work at Stanford. So I'm gonna talk about, you know, what is intellectual property? Uh, what uh, um, what are patents, trade secrets, copyrights, trade trademarks? And if we have time, I'll talk about a few personal stories to illustrate why you need to protect your intellectual property. And then I'll take questions and answers, and give answers. So intellectual property, not everybody understands this actually. That intellectual property is in the Constitution, Article One, Section Eight. You have it there, Congress shall have power to promote the progress of science and useful arts, uh, gives rights to authors and inventors and writers, well, authors and inventors. Uh, one, the reason I mention this is because there's been uh, a lot of attacks on intellectual property rights in the past few decades. And I think it's important for people to understand that our founding fathers actually thought that this was one of the most critical rights. It was in the Constitution before the Bill of Rights. The Patent Act was passed before the Bill of Rights was passed. And the reason for that is that uh, patents and, and intellectual property rights uh, is basically a great equalizer, that, uh, that it, it allows anyone of any means, and by the way, our patent system is specifically designed to allow anyone of any means to, to invent something, even if they don't have the ability to manufacture it. In England, they had a similar system, but you had to build the device and demonstrate it before you could get a patent. And so, of course, the only people who were getting patents were the rich because they had enough money to actually build something and demonstrate it. Whereas the US patent system was designed so that if you can describe it on paper, then you get a patent. And I'll just mention in passing, that before women had the right to vote, uh, they were getting patents and starting successful businesses, and that when African Americans were enslaved and had almost no rights in America, uh, some were still getting patents and some were creating businesses and using that money to free other slaves and promote the abolitionist movement. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. So intellectual property is a form of property that's the result of mental creativity. I've got such as an invention, a novel, a work of music, a computer program. Uh, some people will say that intellectual property is uh, a monopoly. There's a lot of people today that say, well, it's a government monopoly and we shouldn't have monopolies. 
You'll hear that, unfortunately, from a lot of the big tech companies. You hear that coming out of academia. Uh, but I would argue that like it, it's just like physical property, except it's something that someone with hardly any resources can get and can use to build a business to, to produce products, to employ people. And just like with physical property, the government sets the boundaries and enforces its protection. So just like the government does surveys and tells a landowner where his or her property ends and what, what they can do and how they can restrict it, it's the same exact thing with intellectual property. Okay, so now we'll get specifically to patents. The important thing to remember here is patents protect implementations. So they don't protect ideas. Sometimes people say, oh, I've got this great idea for a patent, but ideas can't be patented. Uh, what can be patented are implementations. So in other words, how to take that idea, the idea of a, an automobile that runs on gasoline, that's just an idea, but the actual implementation, which is how to build the engine, is what you can get patented. The, uh, and by the way, if you do have a question, just write in the chat box that you have a question and uh, you know, I'll call on you at the end. You don't have to say what the question is. You, don't, you can if you want to. So uh, there's two kinds of patents, a, design pa a utility patent and a design patent. I'm not too involved with, the, with design patents. Design patents are the look and, the look of, and feel of something. Uh, for example, a, a Coke bottle uh, is, pro I believe it's patented, the, the specific look of the old fashioned Coke bottle, which means that it's not talking about how it functions, but what it looks like, and nobody can copy that design. Uh, if people remember the lawsuit between uh, uh, Apple and Samsung, or one of the many lawsuits between Apple and Samsung over the iPad, uh, there was a disagreement about whether I think Samsung's iPad infringed the design patent of Apple's iPad because it had rounded corners. Now, one thing I'll caution everybody about when you read about a patent in, in a newspaper, a patent lawsuit, they have it simplified it to an extreme detail, uh, to an extreme degree. So you shouldn't assume that the uh, disagreement was really over rounded corners. It, it's possible that it is, but it's more likely that it was something much more sophisticated uh, because most patents are very detailed. And so when, when you read an article that says Amazon was sued over uh, one-click buying, for example, that was another case, you really need to look at the patent. And one-click buying, I've looked at that patent, really has to do with um, storing information in a database, retrieving the information based on the 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 IP address of the computer that's being used, et cetera, et cetera, and when clicking a button, aggregating all that information, sending it to an e-commerce site, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's referred to as the one-click patent. And so people think, oh, Amazon got a patent on pressing a button on a web page, which is not the case. Which is not to say there are not bad patents out there. There are plenty of bad patents, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit later. But I'm usually involved with utility patents, and most people, especially startups, are interested or should be interested in utility patents, which is basically how something functions, how it works. There's two kinds of utility patents, a method patent and an apparatus patent. So a method patent can be a technical process, for example, software, and by the way, method patents don't be uh, um, taken in by some of the hype that software has never been patentable. Methods have always been patentable. Software is a method. We can argue uh, or debate the, the uh, usefulness of a software patent, but understand that methods have always been patentable. Uh, when software came along, uh, it became a little more controversial. Uh, again, that, I'll leave that to another, another time to discuss the details. But software can be a method, but a method can also be a combustion engine, for example. And the method is feeding gasoline, mixing it with oxygen, uh, in, going into a chamber, uh, having a, a spark to ignite a, uh, an explosion, which causes compression, et cetera, et cetera. In, in that case, you're not describing the physical 
aspects of an automobile engine, you're discussing the method that takes place within the automobile uh, engine. There are also business processes and financial processes. Now, these have come under attack in recent years, uh, particularly the America Invents Act, which was passed by Congress uh, in, uh, I think, 20, I believe 2014, so about six years ago, plus some recent Supreme Court decisions that I'll talk about. A business process uh, is, in theory, is still patentable, but in, in reality, it's not. It's very difficult to get a business process patented that will stand up. Uh, I, I personally don't have a problem with restricting business processes, but a business process would be, for example, I want to patent the idea <clears throat> of uh, calling meetings uh, among the business staff every morning at 9 a.m., discussing first financials of the company and then uh, discussing the engineering issues and then uh, ending with a uh, pledge to the company and everybody then letting everyone go back to their offices. Of course, what I've described doesn't sound very useful, but, but there could be useful business processes that, uh, that could give one company an advantage. I mean, for example, that process I've described could be that it gives an advantage because first the revenues are discussed and it, it creates morale within the company. Uh, but those kind of processes are very difficult to patent anymore, if at all possible. And financial processes have also uh, been restricted significantly lately. A financial process would be something like uh, a means of investing in stock in the stock market. So, for example, uh, let's say uh, creating a fund of very large companies and very small companies and uh, requiring investors to invest at least $100,000 that's distributed 40% uh, into such that the fund is distributed 40% into small companies and 60% into large companies waiting uh, one year and at the trigger point when the fund is either down 10% or up 100% then about, uh, liquidating the fund. So that could be a financial process. There's a lot of very interesting financial processes, uh, especially stock investment schemes that, that can be patented in theory, but cannot be patented. These days, it's extremely difficult. Uh, so, so typically, though, what happens is if you have a business or financial process that you want to patent and you feel that it literally that it gives you an advantage over competitors, then what you need to do is you need to describe it in terms of software, which is still difficult to patent, but much more easily patented than business processes or financial processes. So, for example, if you wanted to uh, patent a financial process like I just described, you would patent it in terms of software that uh, enables investment in X percentage of small companies and Y percentage of large companies and uh, keep, keeps track of time and keeps track of losses. And when the loss hits a certain threshold or the gain hits a certain threshold, the fund is liquidated. But if you describe it in terms of software, you've got a much better chance, although still not a great chance, but a much better chance of actually getting a patent. A patent, and when I say getting a patent, if you try hard enough, you can get a patent in almost anything, but it's not going to stand up in litigation. And really, if it doesn't stand up in litigation, then it's not worth having a patent. So uh, the other kind of patent is an apparatus patent. And an apparatus patent describes uh, basically how something is, is what something looks like and how it's connected. So that's easy to understand with a mechanical patent. Uh, it shows, it describes gears and pulleys and levers and, and how they're connected. Not necessarily what, what it does, although your patent has to describe what it does. But the claims, the apparatus claims, would discuss how the device is connected together. The same thing with an electrical patent. It would discuss transistors and resistors and capacitors and switches and how they're connected to create the function that you want, but it would not be described in terms of the function. 
it would be described in, in terms of how everything's, how the different electrical components are connected together. Now, what's interesting is in software, you can do that in software too. It, it might seem a little bit unusual, but you have something that are called Beauregard claims, <clears throat> which these days are called CRM claims. And these are apparatus claims for uh, patents. Now, recently I was at a deposition where I was deposed uh, as an expert about some software and uh, the, the uh, uh, examining attorney asked me about CRM claims. Uh, I didn't know what they were because I'd refer to them as Beauregard claims after a, a Beauregard a case with uh, one of the parties was Beauregard. And I said, oh, oh, you're talking about Beauregard claims and that's a way of turning, of creating a, an apparatus patent for software. And he said, oh, it is really? Are you a lawyer? Do you know that? And he went on and on about implying that I was wrong. Uh, I'll just say this as an aside. When I'm deposed as an expert, the lawyers often try to ridicule my answers to make me uh, nervous, to, to start questioning what I'm saying. And sometimes I don't know if the lawyer really is not aware that these claims are apparatus claims or if he's just trying to shake me. But I actually think that a lot of lawyers don't understand that this is not a new form of patent claim. It's a uh, apparatus claim. And what it does, it, it, it discusses the software, not so much in terms of the functionality, but what pieces there are. So, and this is important to understand. So you wanna have, in your patents, you wanna have method claims, especially software, you wanna have, but all patents, you wanna have method claims and apparatus claims. So why do you need a, a software apparatus claim? which would claim something like uh, software that includes a random number generator, it includes a user interface, it includes a search algorithm. And these are, these are again, structures of the software. Why do you want this? Well, it really depends on what your, the potential infringers are doing. But let's say there's a large company, uh, let's call it uh, MacroHard that makes software and they print CDs or downloadable software and they ship it to their customers or allow their customers to download it and they have hundreds of millions of customers all over the world. They do not infringe a method claim on a patent because they don't use the software themselves. They ship it to 100 million customers and if your software patent has only method claims, you will most likely, there are some ways around this, but you would most likely have to have 100 million individual suits against 100 million businesses and people who are using the software who practice the method when they use the software. There is something called contributing infringement. I won't get into that, but these apparatus claims were designed so that if MacroHard creates software that has all the components of your invention, even if they're not practicing the method, but they put together all the components, which includes electrical bits to implement uh, a search algorithm, to implement a random number generator, to implement a user interface, then that company can be sued for infringement, even though they don't ever use the software they're producing. Uh, so, so something. So, it's important if you're if you're looking at a it's, it's important even for software to have method and apparatus claims. Now, I'm going to talk about a provisional patent. A lot of entrepreneurs have heard of provisional patents. They usually ask me about provisional patents. So what are they? Basically, if you don't have the time or money to do a patent, to hire an attorney or, or a patent, uh, patent agent, but you want to reserve the time, you want to say, here's when I thought of it here's the what's called the priority date you file this placeholder which is basically everything you know about your invention you put it into a patent you file it with a patent office you then have one year to file the actual patent what's called a non-provisional patent i don't like that term because because it really should be real patent and provisional patent uh, but instead it's called a provisional and a non-provisional patent so you have one year to file your what i'll call your real patent and if you don't, then your, your provisional patent is tossed out and ignored. Usually provisional patents are sloppy and they're rushed. 
So uh, sometimes it doesn't have the right information. If you don't have all the information about your invention in the provisional patent, then you're not entitled to that priority date for your non-provisional, for your real patent. The other thing is you can accidentally reveal trade secrets. I'll talk about trade secrets next, but these are things that you want to keep secret. You don't want to even put them in a patent and you don't want your competitors to find out about them. But when you do a provisional patent, there's a tendency to put everything in there and you might realize later, whoops, I put in something that I don't want my competitors to know. But as soon as my patent gets issued, then my competitors can look up my provisional patent and get my trade secrets. I've also found that Rarely, I don't, I can't think of any instance that I remember that I've worked with an entrepreneur who filed a provisional patent and one year, within one year, actually filed the non-provisional, the real patent. I've done that, but I'm a pretty disciplined person and I've only filed a provisional under extreme emergency situations where I didn't realize my time limitation was coming up to file a patent. So I just dumped everything into a provisional patent and within three or four months, I would file the full, real, non-provisional patent. So what I, off, what I always recommend to entrepreneurs especially is for a little bit more work and a little bit more money, or maybe significantly more money, but money that's worth it, uh, you can get a strong non-provisional patent. Once that's filed, then you have a patent pending. You don't have to come back to it until the patent office as an office action where the examiner comes back to you and says, uh, we don't think this patent's any good. And, and that's a process you're always going to have to go through. But in other words, you have a real pending patent at that point. And I think if you do it, if you're smart about it, you understand patents, uh, then, uh, and I've helped companies write real patents, you get it done the first time correctly, and you don't have to redo it or make any mistake, fix any mistakes that you made with the provisional patent. Now here's my slide about be wary of bad patents. I'm seeing something lately and I really don't understand it. I'm, I'm hesitant to call it a scam, but if it's not a scam, I think there's a large number of incompetent patent attorneys out there. I, I hate to say that because I, I, I work with attorneys. I have great attorneys. I have a number of great attorneys that work on my patents. Uh, but what I'm seeing is, uh, uh, attorneys writing patents, especially for startups and entrepreneurs, relatively inexpensive on the order of $3,000, and the patents are horrible. They probably won't get uh, um, issued by the patent office, but if they do get issued, they are not going to stand up in litigation. Now, one thing is you may hear some differing views from different people on things like this, but I, I gave you my experience for a reason. I probably have more experience on all patent issues, all aspects of patents than at least anyone that I'm aware of. The reason for that is I'm an inventor, I'm an entrepreneur, I've started businesses, I've written my own patents, I've worked with attorneys to write patents, I've advised companies to writing patents, I've written a book on patents, and I'm the expert who's called in when, they, when a patent needs to be litigated, which means if I'm on the defense, in other words, working for an infringer, I know exactly what to look for to destroy your patent in litigation or to try to do that. So I know what makes a good patent and a bad patent. And a lot of, a lot of attorneys who write patents have never seen litigation, so they don't understand completely. But having said that, there are certain things they should understand. And I'm seeing patents written by lawyers who don't seem to understand this or they're writing bad patents, I hate to believe this, but they're writing bad patents on purpose because then they will get paid every time the patent office comes back and, and objects to the patent and they have to work with you to try to fix it. Again, I don't know the reason, but I'm seeing this an awful lot. So a few years ago, the Supreme Court made what's called the Alice decision based on the case Alice v. CLS Bank. And uh, in that decision, they basically made a, the Supreme Court doesn't deal with patents very often. In their entire careers, they've rarely, if ever, worked on a patent case. The Federal Court of Appeals uh, was designed specifically for patents, 
and the judges on the Supreme Court don't come from that circuit that works on patents. And yet, in recent decades, they've liked to take on patent cases. So they made this decision at Alice v. CLS Bank to determine what's patentable and what's not. Uh, and, and by the way, I'll tell you, this decision is so confusing that federal circuit judges have made decisions, you can look these up, where they say, I think this is the decision that the, that the Supreme Court president in Alice is saying, but I don't even understand the decision. I'm just doing my best to follow what the Supreme Court said, and this is what I think they meant. So the Supreme Court wrote a very bad, unclear decision. A lot of uh, inventors are trying to get it overturned with legislation from Congress that hasn't been coming. But if I were to summarize, I would say mental processes are not patentable. So what that means is if you can think, if you can perform your patent by just thinking, then you can't get a patent on it. People are not patentable. This is key. If you have a patent and you could perform that patent by two people just talking to it, each other in a room or over a phone or sending each other letters, then it's not patentable. Natural processes are not patentable. This is part of the confusing decision by the Supreme Court because everything in the world is some kind of natural process. It may be guided by a human inventor or, or humans may be guiding the process, but the Supreme Court left it very unclear about what is and isn't patentable with regard to natural processes. This mostly affects things like genetic engineering and bioengineering. Um, but let me give you a concrete example. Taken, this, this is similar to some claim, patent claims that I've seen recently. If you have a claim, a patent claim, that says something like receiving a request for product information, that will not get patented. I mean, the claim, there may be other, this is a claim element, and there are other elements. If all of the elements are like this, you won't get a patent. And you can look over your patents right now, if you have any, and see if you have claims where every element looks like that. What you need to have is something like this. A good claim is something like receiving a request over an electronic network for binary searching an alphanumerically sorted database of hashed product descriptions. As you can hopefully see, that cannot be performed by two people mailing letters or talking to each other or done in your head because it requires an electronic network, it requires a complex searching algorithm, it requires a database, it requires hashing. So generally the first one is bad, the second one is good. And the other thing I'll say is that when you submit your patent to the patent office, you have a specification that describes how the patent works and you have a, uh, and you have the claims which describe the exact invention. You can always change the claims before the patent's issued. You can never change the specification. So if your specification is all about receiving requests and sending, sending requests and uh, things like that, uh, then, then, then once you've filed it, you can't change that and that means the patent is really not going to be any good. it's not going to be enforceable. So my, my uh, advice to especially startups is file at least one patent. It may cost a little money. Uh, I've, I've advised companies, I'm not saying you need to do this, but if you find someone who can advise you, uh, well, I am recommending you can find someone who can advise you on how to write the patent, or if you can do as much of it yourself and then send it to an attorney, you can get your cost down typically between three to $10,000 for filing one patent, but you'll have to do a lot of work yourself. If you give it all to an attorney, if you just have some meetings with an attorney and the attorney has to write it from scratch and phone you and talk to your technical people on a regular basis, it's gonna cost more like 10 to $20,000. But you should file it early. You should find a good patent attorney, look, ask them to, ask to see some of the patents they've done in the past. So you can look to see if it's a good patent or not. Uh, why do you want patents? You want them, one, for defensive reasons. So first of all, let me dispel the myth that you will be sued by a giant company for patent infringement while you're a startup. It's never happened in the history of the world. 
I know people have said, oh, I know a friend who told me that his cousin worked at a startup and they went out of business. Sometimes startups founders need an excuse to go out of business. They don't wanna say we ran out of money, so they'll say we got sued. Um, you won't get sued until you're making at least $10 million in revenue, probably not until you're making $100 million in revenue, because if you're not making that kind of money, no big company cares about you. There's dozens of companies that are not making money and they just don't get sued for patent infringement. Uh, but if you start to make between 10 and $100 million, you better have that patent ready. You don't wanna file it at that point because if a company sues you, then you wanna be able to say, okay, we're countersuing for infringement of our patent. And then you get into a negotiation. Without a patent, you can't negotiate. You know, some big company sues you and you just have to go to court. There's, there's just nothing you can do. But if you have your own patent, you can counter sue and then start negotiating with them. Uh, it's also lasting value. Uh, unfortunately, most startups fail. And I know from experience that uh, if you have a patent, you still have something of value. It can sometimes be even more valuable than the company would have been because now you've got 10 or 100 companies using the technology you invented and you can license it, license your patent to them. And then for offensive reasons, if you end up becoming that 100 million or, or $1 billion company, you want to stop copycats from entering the industry and you can do that through patents. Okay, so now I get the trade secrets. This is another kind of intellectual property. Different jurisdictions, by that I mean different states, have different uh, definitions of trade secrets. And now there's a, a federal definition of trade secrets, but they're all generally the same. A trade secret is something that uh, is not generally known to the public. So you, anything that's known already can't be your secret. That seems fairly obvious, I hope. It has to have an economic benefit from not being known, which means that uh, if you're a company that manufactures computers and you have, uh, you know, you, you like, um, um, you know, you, you play uh, card games and you keep your strategies at your card game secret, but it doesn't affect your business at all. This is just something you keep secret. It's not a trade secret. It has to be something that affects your business and, and that your competitors don't know. And if they knew, they would have an advantage. And here's the most important part you need to take reasonable efforts to maintain its secrecy. So it's a very fuzzy definition, which can be used to your advantage. So as, whereas uh, patents protect implementations, trade secrets can pre protect ideas. Suppose you have an idea for a new thingamabob that you're gonna sell, it's a new social network. Uh, just that idea can be protected as a trade secret. So trade secrets protect all kinds of stuff, any kind of, any kind of business advantage, technology, business methods, customer lists, business plans, ideas, and something interesting called negative know-how. Negative know-how says, let's say you're inventing a light bulb and you've tried 1,362 different filaments to see which would work for your light bulb and found that, that 1,361 of them did not work and the last one did work. Knowledge of which things did not work is also a trade secret because now if someone knew that, they could skip all those experiments that you did and it would help them get to, to understand the best filament for a light bulb. So, so a big advantage to trade secrets are that it covers almost anything that's a business advantage and it's not defined anywhere as long as it's an advantage to your business. So how do you tr protect trade secrets? This is very easy to do, and it's something that a lot of people just don't do. If you remember one thing from this uh, presentation, please remember this, because so I've seen so many companies. I, I saw a company that, that did this that had really nothing. Uh, they, they went to a two people, came up with an idea, developed a prototype, went to a billion dollar company, got a presentation to their executives. The presentation was marked confidential and it contained nothing confidential in it. Most of it was available on a website, but because they had marked it confidential, the judge allowed it to go to court and they wanted $30 million. They didn't get it, but they wanted $30 million for their trade secrets. So what I'm gonna tell you, 
get NDAs signed from everyone. I've underlined everyone. The problem is, let's say you tell your friends about this idea. Let's say you tell them, you send them an email saying, hey, here's this great idea, what do you think of it? If you go to litigation because somebody stole your trade secrets, there's something called discovery where they can ask for your emails and they say, look, here's a whole bunch of people where you told them without asking them to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which means you were not protecting your, you were not protecting your invention or your idea. Therefore, it's not a trade secret. And you could lose your entire case because you told your friends in an email, here's my idea, what do you think of it? Okay, so get NDAs from everyone you talk to and everyone who's legitimate will sign an NDA, except often venture capitalists will not sign an NDA. This is very frustrating. Uh, I'm going to tell you straight out that the reason they won't sign it is typically because they want the ability to steal your idea. I'm a venture capitalist. I know venture capitalists. I have a lot of respect for venture capitalists, but there's also a lot of con artists out there. There are a lot of people, or let's say a lot of people who, who have questionable ethics. And if your idea will help their current business, they would love to use it. And they don't want a record that they talked to you or that they took your idea. So my recommendation is don't, <laughs> don't talk to anyone <clears throat> who refuses to sign an NDA. However, in some cases, uh, there may be some like venture capitalists, you desperately need their money, they refuse to sign an NDA. Uh, mark every document you have as confidential. This is so simple. This is what those two people who sued the billion dollar firm that I just mentioned, this is what they had done. They took their 12 slide presentation, most of which was available on their website. They later took it down from their website, but every doc, every slide, every slide, not just the introductory slide, every slide was marked confidential at the bottom. The big company ended up sending those slides to some other company saying, what do you think of this idea? During discovery, those emails came out and the judge said, yes, this is going to court. He didn't say this was a trade secret. He didn't say this was, uh, that, that these were valuable. But what he said was there's enough evidence to show that the large company had possibly violated these two people's trade secret. So unfortunately, I, I recently have been advising a company that's been doing business with a very large partner. Uh, they did not get an NDA. They did not mark their documents confidential. And now it looks like that partner is creating a competing product. The partner's a billion dollar company and the startup I was advising may not be around much longer. Let me get through this. I'll, I'll go through this quickly and uh, talk about. So this is uh, this will be online. You can see this later, but there's different issues. Patents go public. Um, trade secrets, you can keep them private forever. However, the main thing is if somebody if you have the trade secret for the formula for Coca-Cola and somebody happens to figure it out without ever looking at, at what you're doing, or they reverse engineer it, which is perfectly legal. They actually take, take your Coke and they, they figure out all the chemicals in it and they figure out the recipe that's perfectly legal. Uh, they now have Coke and they can, they can put out their own co uh, competing product. Whereas with a patent, when you get a patent for 20 years, you have the right to use that patent and nobody can use it even if they did nothing unethical, if they just happen to come across the same thing, they have an obligation to see that it's your patent and they shouldn't be using it without paying you for the rights to it. I'll talk now about copyrights. Uh, copyrights are original works of authorship. They can be literary, dramatic, musical, artistic. They can be software. One thing that's not always understood is that they can be published or unpublished. You don't have to publish a work to get a copyright in it. Uh, and in fact, you get the copyright as soon as the work is substantially complete. You don't have to register it with the government. You have the copyright. And it protects the expression, not the idea. So if the idea is to a young, young man and a young woman from two different families that are feuding, they fall in love and the families disapprove and there's a big fight and at the end they die, uh, that idea cannot be protected. So uh, you can still, even though uh, uh, Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet many years ago and his copyright, if he had one expired by now, 
but you can still write West Side Story. You can still write many of the novels and plays and movies that are in existence. You just cannot copy the exact words or the patterns of the words. You have to come up with it independently. Same thing with software. The copyright, what it does is it gives you the right to reproduce the work, to prepare derivative work. So if you decide you want to take um, Harry Potter and write Harry Potter's latest adventure, you better be careful because that's probably going to violate the copyright of uh, A.J. Rowling. Uh, you can't distribute. You're the only one who can distribute copies, perform the work publicly, uh, to display the work publicly. So these are the rights that belong to the author. And the author can choose to give them away freely, just like with software, with the open source movement. The open source movement exists because of copyright law. Without copyright law, the open source movement wouldn't exist because the open source movement says you can copy the code, but with these specific restrictions. And the reason there are restrictions is because they own the copyrights and they determine what restrictions to put on anyone who uses those copyrights. So, so don't, don't misunderstand. Some people misunderstand and think that, oh, if, if we didn't have copyrights, everything would be open source. No, if we didn't have copyrights, everybody would be stealing and copying with no regulations. They could change it, they could modify it, they could claim it's their own, they could charge for it, they could do whatever they wanted to. The copyright system protects every piece of software and every published, every published and non-published work. So you have a copyright when the work is created. You can register with the Copyright Office for $35. You don't need a lawyer. Go to the website. It has detailed instructions. For $35, there's no reason not to do it. And if you're working on software, when the software is substantially completed, let's say it's 80%, 75%, 80% completed, you should submit it to the Copyright Office through the website, pay $35. If you ever have to litigate, because let's say one of your employees leaves and takes the software with you and starts a competing company, then you need to have registration before you can litigate. But the government says if you litigate right after you produce it, you can get more damages and you might be able to get your legal fees back. If you wait, you're, you're gonna get less damages and you might not be able to get your legal fees. Uh, an infringement of a registered copyright is easier to prove because the government assumes that since you registered the copyright, that you're the rightful owner of it. And then the other party has to show how they didn't infringe or they didn't copy or they're the rightful owner. And it's much more difficult for the infringing party to prove that. Software copyright. There's a strange uh, rule with software copyright where you don't have to make your code public. You, can, you only have to submit 50 pages of code. You print it out, print out 50 pages, and then you can redact anything that contains trade secrets. So if there's an algorithm in your code that you want to protect, you redact it. You basically block it out when you submit it to the Copyright Office. It's a little bit strange because I've actually seen cop software copyright registrations, and I'm not saying this is a, a good thing, it, it's odd, but seeing copyright registrations, you can request them from the Copyright Office, particularly if there's litigation going on. These, these, the registrations of, these, of the software in the Copyright Office consisted of 50 nearly blank pages because the, whoever registered them redacted almost every single line of code. But, just, but don't worry that you're going to be giving away your trade secrets by copywriting, you won't. And you don't need a lawyer. Uh, the instructions are right there on the site. Copyright infringement, if somebody takes your code and copies any part of it, even a small part of it, it's infringement. And, and you should be aware of that if you come from an employer and you think you can do this, don't. If you copy it but modify it, it's still copying. If you use it as a reference, let's say you have it on your desk while you're writing your own code, if that can be proven, and I've proven that in some copyright cases, uh, then that is still copyright infringement. You should have no contact with any old code when you're writing new code. And if you have to copy code, if you have to copy the concepts of code, not the code itself, the concepts, the algorithms, you need to use a software clean room. That's something I've written about in my book. You can look it up. I won't go into detail about it now. Trademarks, we're getting towards the end and then I'll take questions. We're almost at the end. 
trademarks. They protect names of products, brands, companies, service, services. I strongly recommend that you trademark your company name, your product name. Again, very inexpensive. You can do it online. It's $275. You don't need a lawyer. I can tell you several times, I've even had very large companies decide they liked the name of my product, and so they were going to use it. And uh, I sent them cease and desist letters. I rarely had to get a lawyer involved, but sometimes a lawyer would send, I have a lawyer send them a letter, and nobody wants to get involved in a trademark dispute if your trademark is registered with the, the trade patent and trademark office. Nobody wants to get in a dispute like that because they will lose. And so even this large company took down a giant sign they'd made, they changed their letterhead, they changed their company name um, because I told them they were infringing my trademark. Okay, a couple of personal stories and then we'll get to Q&A. Evolt, uh, I invented remote backup. I did this in the early 90s. My friends mostly told me that I was crazy, that nobody would ever send their personal data over phone lines to an unknown computer to be stored somewhere. That would never happen. I felt they were wrong. I created a system to do that. I couldn't get funding. I filed a patent. I went to a lecture at the Stanford Business School where a business professor said that uh, patents were, were useless because technology moved too quickly. By the time you get a patent, the technology is obsolete. And I thought, well, if a Stanford Business School professor says that, he must be right. I abandoned my patent. Somebody else filed a similar patent one month after mine. They are now collecting licenses from all the, from all the uh, remote backup companies like iDrive and, and others that, uh, and eVault, um, it's now a multi-billion dollar industry. If I had done that, uh, my, my life story would be a little different. However, I did, re I did register the eVault trademark and a company I went to for funding, listened to my presentation, signed my non-disclosure agreement. I gave them my business plan. I discussed the technology with them, never heard it from them until a couple of years later a company called eVault popped up. And then at some point, the president called me up and said, you know, Bob, we have this funny uh, situation where we have this company and it's growing and our investors pointed out that we don't own the trademark for the company name. So we'd like to give you a little bit of money just to get that trademark. And I said, well, it's interesting because I gave you a presentation and you know that and you signed an NDA, which I have, and yeah, I showed you my business plan. So in order to get the registration for the trademark, you're going to give me a lot of money and a stake in your company. And they did, because otherwise they would not have gotten funding. That company was later sold to Seagate, and although I made good money off of that deal, I would have made 10 times as much had I had a patent. The final story is about a product that I made called Molasses, and I sold this to a large company. It enabled them to sell multi-million dollar products that they couldn't sell without my software. After seven years of selling them my software, uh, then uh, they told me they're going to do it on their own. I told them I have a patent. They basically said, we don't think it's any good, but if you want to sue us, a lawyer told, uh, told me it would cost a minimum of $2 million to sue them, which I didn't have at the time. So I went to a non-practicing entity, which you may have heard described as a patent troll. Let me make it clear. To me, this was a patent white knight because I went to them and I said, I don't have the money to sue this company that killed my business because they stopped buying products from me and are knowingly infringing on my patents and dared me to sue them because they know I can't afford to. And this NPE, non-practicing entity, said, we will buy your patents from us. And I said, will you sue them? And they said, what we do with it after that is not your business, but we'll buy your patents from them, from you. So uh, there were Actually, this, this only shows five of the patents. Initially, there ended up being, I think, seven patents. They were all purchased by this a patent white knight. And for all I know, they sued this billion dollar company that I couldn't afford to sue because that billion dollar company put me out of business by stealing my intellectual property. So remember that when you, when you hear about patent trolls. Okay, there is my... Um, my contact information, if I haven't answered your questions, I'll take questions now. Let's see if uh, I'll go through here and find them. And uh, if you need to contact me, uh, I'm, I'm always happy to talk. I'm not too busy these days. I think when we're out of lockdown, I'm going to be busy again. 
this this event, by the way, I'm, I am recording it, so I will post it and I'll put out a notice where it's posted. Uh, okay, I see uh, Pamora has a question. Can you unmute yourself or do I need to unmute you? I'm unmuted. Great, there you Hi, go. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my question is regarding, I think you covered it already, but the 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 actual manufacturing process that Toyota created um, and this has now a widespread use over the world because they gave it away, would that have been possible to copyright or not copyright patent or I don't know the legal term for it, but would that have been a process that is, they basically invented lean? Yeah, so, so yes, uh, in essence they could, but it depends. If it's a process that doesn't connect to anything physical, it would have been patentable years ago, but not anymore. It's, it's very difficult. But I can tell you the first patent case I ever worked on. This is after the Stanford Business School professor said patents were not valuable. And probably a year later, a Stanford professor in electrical engineering asked me to work on a patent case for Texas Instruments. We examined the wafer handling process. This was the process for wafers to go through a machine. And because it was connected to hardware, uh, it, was, it was easier to enforce the patent. But the process was basically uh, handing off a wafer to, to a wafer station, waiting for a signal to come back that the processing was done, then grabbing it and handing it to another wafer station. I worked on that case with some of the, they flew in experts from around the world to work on this, flew them in, flew us into Dallas. We spent months on that. We wondered how can Texas Instruments afford, we, everybody was charging a lot and, and much more than me at the time, because we had these world renowned people working on the case. And then one day they told us to stop because there'd been a settlement. This was against Samsung. They were suing Samsung. And Samsung settled that case for $1.1 billion. The next year they sued Hyundai and Hyundai again settled for $1.1 billion. So the question is, yes, Toyota in, in theory could, could have um, um, patented the process, if, but particularly if they could tie it to some kind of hardware as opposed to just being a process. But the other thing is, let me, let me just say, sometimes it doesn't make business sense to do that. Uh, first of all, you have to defend a, a patent. And if your patent is too similar to something that already exists, then it'll be invalidated. Sometimes, uh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why you want to do things. I, I have, I just really quickly, I have a friend who's created this phenomenal artwork based on fractals, and he insists on getting a patent in the process. And the thing is, it's so specific. I've told him, don't get a patent just go and lecture about the process so that everybody starts using it and then you become famous as the person who invented it. And you can charge money to consult on it, but he, he wants to get a patent and I just don't think it's the right thing to do. Okay, so. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Jeremy Walker. Uh, yeah. So I was just curious, um, if you think about like a consumer electronic product, there's circuitry that you could look at from an apparatus patent standpoint. There's software for apparatus. There's software for method. There's the you know the actual enclosure that you could think of as a design patent. Uh, as a startup company, should we be thinking about trying to just get as many patents, uh, even of each category as we can, or should we just really hammer down on like a single apparatus patent, for example? Well, so when you do a patent, you'll probably have, I should have made this a little more clear. You'll have, you'll have one thing, whether it's software or hardware, you'll have one patent that has apparatus claims and method claims. You really want to have both types of claims. Uh, I wasn't clear on that. But my recommendation is most startups don't have enough money to pursue a full patent portfolio. And by the way, there are companies out there. I have my doubts about them. I, I know some good people that do this. They recommend a patent strategy, but if you're a venture capital funded you know, unicorn and you've got 10 million in the bank, sure, get a patent strategy and hire someone to help you with that. But if you're a typical startup, I would say pick the hardest thing that you had to develop and patent that, just that. If you can afford to do more than one, do more than one, but it could be a distraction. As far as a design patent, unless, Design patents are, are usually for companies that have something that looks so unique in the consumer market only that if a consumer sees it on the shelf, they're going to recognize it. If you're not a consumer product, 
a consumer product company or your design is not so unique that people would immediately recognize it, then I don't think a design patent is worthwhile at all. Okay, and just a quick follow up on that. If we were a consumer product that could be recognizable on the shelf, do you think as a startup you should pursue that or is that something for down the road? You know, I think, honestly, I think you should talk to a uh, patent attorney who specializes in design patents, which I don't. But I will say this, you can get very similar protection by, by doing a uh, trademark on the design. And if you trademark the design, it's very inexpensive. I honestly, I've talked to lawyers about why get a design patent when you can get a trademark. So the trademark can apply to a name or it can apply to a design. Uh, trademarks are really inexpensive. They're very powerful, but they're not as powerful as a patent. But a patent requires litigation. As I mentioned with trademarks, I've resolved trademark issues with just a letter from a lawyer. Even with large companies, they, it, it, they just don't want to deal with it. But a patent is going to go to court and you could win, you could win money on a design patent lawsuit, but you're going to have to spend a lot of money. And so I've never completely understood, unless you're Apple, where you just want to have every, you know, bullet in your gun. Uh, I don't know why the company would do a design patent, but you should talk to a, an attorney who specializes in design patents. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so there's Catherine Lancioni. Did I, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, I'm here. I was muted. So I appreciate you calling me out. Um, so I do, I'm a PR person and I'm in the process of writing a book um, and I have a model that I'm introducing in the book. So my first question, and, and the book is being published by Kendall Hunt, so it has a real publisher. So my first question to you is, um, how do I protect the model from being, um, for, to, to make sure it's attributed to me? And the second question is, um, I do a lot of public speaking. Um, and have themes that I use in my uh, speeches. And for example, one of them is called Define You, Y-O-U. And it's sort of a motivational lecture. Um, and, and when I do these lectures, I have a lot of people that come that are potential competitors to me. So they're life coaches, executive coaches, um, people like that. And I know they take notes. And I know they um, have, in some way, shape, or form, sort of reused the concepts. So how do you, in both situations, how do you make sure that if someone is, that if someone's, that, how do you protect these ideas? I guess that's my question for you. So both the model and the theme. And I know if they're, they're both more IP, am I right on, in that sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, so the question is what kind of IP? And, and if you want, we can have an offline discussion sometime. But I'll tell you, okay. so I, I've been in a similar situation. I created something called the Universal Design Methodology. Right. So first of all, there's no way I know of patenting it. You could apply for a patent, you might even get a patent, but it wouldn't stand up if you were to litigate. Okay. I can just tell you that. Uh, you can trademark the name, which I did for mine, but unfortunately, okay. when I tried to publish about it, nobody wanted to publish with the trademark symbol. If you don't publish with the trademark symbol, you you potentially lose the right. Okay. But, but magazines told me they would not include that. Okay. Um, you can copyright everything, which only means if people copy it word for word. But if you cop, you know, if you copyright, for example, a diagram or a description of your method, then uh, you know, just submit that to the copyright office. You have some protection because most people are going to copy what you've done and then change it, and you could right. go after them for that. I think realistically, and again, as we can talk offline, yeah. my experience has been my methodology. You know, did it, it caught on in certain niche areas, and when I search online for it, uh, I see it, and my name is associated with it. And as long as my name is associated with it, I don't have a problem. Yeah, um, I agree with you on that one. Yeah. Yeah, but there's no guarantee, and I think it's really, honestly, it's. I think you know, I would suggest copyright. Do a copyright on it. Do a trademark okay. on it on the name of it, but expect it to be violated. But hope that it's not violated or infringed enough times, you know, that you're given credit for it enough times that uh, it's worthwhile. I doubt if you're going to be able, it's probably not going to pay your lawyer's cost to go 
uh, sue somebody unless, if you're lucky, some big corporation adopts it as their own, and then you can go after them. But if, individual, right. if individuals are doing it, it's just going to be really hard to do anything about it. Right. And one of the things that um, another, actually, through Cornell, another IP attorney had told me was that it's important that you just that you establish a, um, a, a history of using the term or the item. So, like for on my website, one of the themes that I use, I have it. It's, it's all over the place um, because that shows that it's an, an idea or a thought that's been contributed to you, and that made that made intellectual sense to me. Do you agree with that? Right, and also if you trademark it and copyright it, you'll have a date supported by government agencies that say this is when I used it. Okay. If somebody comes along later. The other thing that might be helpful, um, again, it might be a, another conversation for us. But, um, so I, uh, if you have a Wikipedia page, yeah, you can get it on your Wikipedia page. Um, I don't know if you have one. No, I, I don't think I do. At least last time I checked, I didn't. I didn't set one up. Here's the thing. You, I had a roommate at Cornell who, who ended up dropping out and writing for Saturday Night Live and he became kind of a cult figure. Um, I used to go to his Wikipedia page and try to correct stuff that I just knew was wrong. They, they had <laughs> wrong stuff and they wouldn't let me. They, they just said, you know, you don't have any references. Well, I mean, I knew the guy, I lived with him, um, but okay. But then I started, I tried to put together my own Wikipedia page and it was immediately taken down. What I recommend is you can actually hire people or best idea is find friends to put up a Wikipedia page, but, uh, uh, or hire a company to do it as long as it doesn't come from you uh -huh. and they point to sources. But if you get some of these things in your Wikipedia page, it turns out that now Google points to your Wikipedia page. If somebody looks for that term, it goes to your Wikipedia page. And that I've found in my career has been one of the best things for getting recognition for stuff that I've done. That's so interesting. That never would have occurred to me. Thank you for that suggestion. That's great. Sure. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, so now I've got um, Joe Pendergast. Pendergast. Yeah. Hey, Bob. Thanks for the presentation. Sure. Um, I was just wondering, I'm thinking about a company that's kind of like an Airbnb, Uber, WAG, like a networking type company, networking effect type company. I'm just wondering, I'm trying to get a, my head around, can you think with one of those companies what they might patent? Yeah, so first of all, I've had a lot of companies tell me we don't have anything that's patentable. And I mentioned my molasses software that I sold. Uh, sorry, the molasses, I sold the software and then, then sold the patents. Uh, for an entire year, friends told me to get it patented and I said there's nothing patentable here. And then it turns out it was, uh, it was patentable, and I realized that a lot of stuff is mm. patentable, but you need to think about it in the right way. So my recommendation for companies, you know, for these gig companies, Airbnb and Uber, I'm sure what they've patented is not their business method. They might have, but it's very difficult to enforce, if at all. But what they mm -hmm. have patented is their software, so and tie it in with their business method. Mm. So in other words, uh, with Uber, I'm, I'm, sh I'm certain that they, almost certain that they have a patent for uh, a driver that has a, an app that records where that driver is. And, and there's another app on, with a user that records where that user is. And the user puts in a request to, that goes to a server. The server sorts through the request, does a, 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 uses an algorithm to find the, the minimum distance or minimum time, and assigns a driver to a user, that kind of thing. So in other mm -hmm. words, whatever they're doing is going to be tied to the software that they're using. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. And Sophia H. Hi, yes, uh, thank you so much for this incredible presentation. Um, let me go back to my question. So um, I created a, an organization and um, it's for women and I won't go into too much detail, but obviously it's been an idea I've had to share with, um, you know, different people on my on my team that I've built as well as with a few attorneys. Unfortunately, we've definitely faced our fair share of sexism um, and um, 
you know, and just um, like xenophobia throughout this whole process. And so unfortunately, we brought up the idea to a few attorneys who um, are eager to help us and then all of a sudden just kind of disappear on us and don't really um, help us any further. And so my question was more so um, based on the NDA and what your advice would be for those of us like myself who want to find uh, access to an NDA that's easy, affordable, accessible, um, and then my second question to that was, is there a way to also have people who we've mentioned this idea to already be able to sign an NDA after the fact? Sure, good questions. And, and I understand some people may need to drop off. I think what we're coming to, but I, I, I want to take all the questions, but you know, feel free to drop off if you need to. Uh, so these are good questions. First of all, I'll tell you, I, I have these conversations all the time about people not getting back to me. Uh, you're not alone. Uh, I, I just yesterday I I'm talking to some lawyers about a deal I'm trying to put together, and we're trying to find investors. And I told them that I talked to probably 50 investors so far, and most of them never responded. Some of them responded and said they were interested, and then just disappeared. I, I don't ever do that, but and I don't understand why other people do that. But I've just learned over the years that that happens. Um, so it's I think it's unfortunately just a part of business that I needed to get used to, that some people will never respond or respond once and never again. Uh, but I think it's a good idea to try to get everyone to sign an NDA. And uh, I can, you know, I can post my generic NDA. It's gone through revisions over the years and a lot of lawyers have reviewed it. I think my NDA is better than ones you might find online because some, some of the ones online are very specific for specific purposes, even if they don't say that. Mine's very generic. So when I post this talk, I'll also post an NDA that you can use. Um, uh, but I mean, you can use, you know, most of them are pretty standard. But I think it is a good idea to get an NDA signed. And I'll give you some advice that I gave to uh, another uh, friend she had asked me, uh, she was in the same situation where people had not signed NDAs. And I said, um, if you can, th this is more of a business issue, uh, negotiation issue. If, if you can, try to get them to sign it without alerting them to the fact that you want them signing an NDA. Because some people, for whatever reason, just get turned off by having to sign any form. And so my recommendation is go to them and say, oh, by the way, we have a, we, we have a formal process where everybody's supposed to sign an NDA and we forgot to have you do that. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, the problem is they may never do it, but I wouldn't, I just try to make it as casual and make it just sound like something that is part of your normal business practice, which it should be, uh, as opposed to saying, oh, we told you some stuff that, you know, we don't want you to tell. I mean, just don't make a big deal about it. Just make it sound like it's part of your normal business practice. And hopefully they'll sign it, but unfortunately they have, they don't have much incentive to do that. So did that answer your question? Yeah, and then the point about the confidential documents was also really helpful. Um, <clears throat> now, in, sorry, a quick follow-up question. So when we're sharing it with attorneys, for example, in that case, it's still not protected, right? Well, attorneys, if you're sharing with attorneys, actually, I should have mentioned this. Attorneys, you have an, an attorney-client privilege, even if they have not signed you as a client. Mm. If, if you're going to them for legal advice, you have an implied NDA. So you don't really need to get an NDA from attorneys. I usually ask attorneys for an NDA, and I, I don't think I've ever been turned down. And my explanation is, for a trade secret, I just want to have a paper trail so that if it ever does go to court, you know, there's... Let me give you an example of where it, it, I wouldn't have attorney client privilege. My brother is an attorney. And mm -hmm. if I talk to him, it could be argued that I was talking to him as a brother, not as an attorney, and therefore there was no confidentiality. So, um, you know, it's just safer to always have an NDA. And most attorneys, if you tell them that, uh, and, and usually the companies I advise, by the way, I tell them, look, make me to be the bad guy. They say, look, we've got this an advisor. He's He's a stickler for IP and formality and forms, and we know he's going overboard, but, you know, he insists that he's going to, you know, he, he won't work with us unless we have everybody sign this. And then they can't argue with you because, you know, it's not your idea. It's my idea. 
So that's another thing that you can do. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, so I see Ruslan Raskopov. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Bob. That was an amazing presentation. And uh, we're, we're kind of going through the setting up the startup now. And we've heard a lot of talks on IP and stuff. And yours so far was the most valuable. Uh -huh. So uh, long story short, we already registered a company, but we haven't yet applied for a trademark. And before we were registering the company, we actually first checked the trademark database. If there's a name such as ours, there were, was no name. But after when we registered the company, we found out that the .com domain with our name was already occupied. Mm -hmm. So we registered a different domain and it's kind of fun. And now we also see that the .com domain is up for sale. So uh, my question is, do we need, is it okay for us to register a, just a name trademark without the actual logo, with the design logo, or it's better to wait until we actually have a design logo, apply for trademark of the name plus the logo, and then try to, uh, what, what do you call it? Uh, try to get the .com domain uh, by saying that, hey, we have a trademark, we're a registered company. So, so let me say that the domain name issue is complicated because the law is changing about whether domain names can be trademarked and how they can be trademarked. Um, also, just as an aside, because I've been through this, be wary of companies that sell you the domain name and then want to charge you a fortune for it. I've that's happened to me a few times, and I've ended up changing my company name rather than pay a fortune for a domain name. Uh, having said that, I find it's usually better, just more convenient to trademark just the name, not the design. Uh, I Let me put it this way. The names of my companies and products are always unique. Within The trademark only applies to a specific uh, area. So in other words, if, if you have a company called, uh, I don't know, cookies and, and you're actually a cookie company, another company can have a company called cookies, which is a high tech, uh, you know, company that, that deals with cookies on, the, on websites. And both of them can have trademarks because they're in different fields and there's no, there's no chance of someone accidentally going to your company to order cookies. Um, so keeping that in mind, usually my names, my company names are unique enough that I just registered the name for a trademark and uh, but only the design in some cases like I have something called the Silicon Valley napkin where the name was questioned by the trademark company but I had a design because Silicon Valley is used Silicon Valley napkin is a generic term in some cases uh, but I could I could in that case trademark the design and because it was a consumer product the design was important so I would say go for the name and then when you've got a logo, if you it's so cheap, you can also, whenever you've got the logo, or even if you've been using the logo, you can trademark it at any time. Uh, because it's so cheap, you may as well do that also. But the name, I think, is the most important thing to protect. Okay, okay. got it. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Richard Codley, I see, uh, or Caudle, I see your question about... Yeah. Um, so my question is really, I've actually got a couple of questions, but the first one is um, we created an operating system for AI and we're calling it AI OS. Um, and so is it better to have a TM or a circle R? So the TM means that you consider it your trademark. The circle R means that you've registered it with the government, with the copyright, with, sorry, with the patent mark office. Okay. You're not allowed. So we, to, you're not allowed to use the circle R. You can use the trade the TM at any point. But you're not allowed to use the circle R until you've registered your trade trademark office, and they've gotten back to you that it's accepted. Okay. Great. Great. So I have a question for the um, actual operating system. It's like iOS is for the phones, and DOS was for the computers. It doesn't exist today. And uh, we're introducing it this weekend um, in, the, in the beta. So do, should we be copywriting this or should we be patenting to this? Both. Or so you should get a patent, especially if it's an operating system. You want to find something that's patentable. You're, you're going to have a lot of other patents. You're going to have to research to find out what you've got that hasn't already been invented or hasn't been patented by somebody. Yeah. But I strongly suggest, because you're going into a very competitive 
Apple, Microsoft, um, they are very litigious companies. And, and if you have any kind of success, you want to make sure you have at least one patent, if not more. So I would patent something in the software that it's doing that's unique. And by the way, I'll tell you Intel's strategy. I've worked for Intel. Uh, it's not necessarily your strategy, but Intel doesn't really care if anybody makes a microprocessor, but they do not want people making clones of Intel processors without licensing it from Intel. So Intel's patents will be very specific to an Intel processor talking about having a specific register that has a specific function because if if somebody makes a clone that does not have that register with that bit windows won't run on it so anyway that's just something to keep in mind for your patents but that's that's a longer question and you should definitely copyright the code which means you know again you go to the the copyright office you know and we can have a later discussion about this but there there's they have rules that are very apparent on how to copyright software what you have to submit and you do that plus uh, what did I say? Thirty-five dollars, and you now have a registered copyright. Great, great. Well, I appreciate that. I get your email off this uh, presentation. Okay. Thank you. And now I have uh, what Roger Mann. Hi, Bob. Thanks for staying late on this. Uh, I wanted to get your advice. Uh, our company's getting ready next week to submit for. Uh, trademark or word mark for product uh, name. Mm -hmm. And when we searched tests, we found other companies with the name that are in verticals that are adjacent, but not the same vertical, but none that had it in the software as a service, which is what our product is, which is the class 42. So I thought if, if we submitted just to the IC42, and we do have two patent utility patents, and we wanted to use language in the utility patent to show that the word was unique to our go to market so it wouldn't get confused with the other companies. So, so let me say, in theory, you can have uh, two different word marks uh, trademarked in different classes, but it's it's not always easy to predict what the patent ex what the trademark examiner will say. Uh, I've had trademark examiners come back in that kind of situation and say, well, this there's confusion here. In fact, in one case, I couldn't convince the trademark examiner with my trademark attorney that there would not be confusion. So you can get something you can get something called a uh, like a provisional trademark where you get the right to use the circle R. And you have most of the rights of a registered trademark, but there's like a, an asterisk next to it. It doesn't really seem to affect anything, but I think what it means is if another company with a trademark in a different class comes after you, decides to sue you, then your registered trademark is not as strong uh, in that litigation. So what you have to consider, I think, is do you think there's any possibility that customers of one product will accidentally find your product. And if so, then you might wanna consider changing the name of your product. But if you're pretty confident that that wouldn't happen, then you can stick with uh, registering your own trademark. Thank you, great advice, appreciate your time. Sure. <clears throat> so John Lynn, you've got a question about Oracle v. Google. Is John still there? Uh, yeah, I'm just unmuted. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious. Hello, can can yeah, you hear me? I can hear you. Um, so I know that that litigation has been going on for quite a while, and I'm just curious as to your your opinion um, in regards to APIs and 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 copy. Are they copyrightable? Sure. So that's a really good question, and we can we can talk further offline if you want. I mean, it's, it's an excellent question. And But I have to tell you, I am an expert for Oracle on that case. But look, I take, the, the fact is I take every case, my company takes every case without, without uh, regardless of what the position is. And we do our best to support our client. But if we feel that our client's wrong, 
After we've done an analysis, then we will tell them that we can't support their position. It's a little bit different between my company and other companies, unfortunately, because other experts will often take a position and they will twist in pre into pretzels to support their client's position, which we want to. Having said that, uh, I have strongly supported Oracle's position in this case, and I've written about it. You can search for it online. Uh, th there's a misunderstanding of the definition of APIs in, among software engineers, and there's a misunderstanding of the case. Um, unfortunately, among lawyers who don't know much about software too, the thing is APIs in software have always been copyrightable. There's never been a question until Google brought it up. And every judge, except uh, I think maybe the first one, uh, said that APIs are copyrightable. The thing, is, the thing to remember is that it's kind of like, my analogy is, and then we can talk about it later. I know there's a lot of people who disagree with me, but I'm, I'm fairly certain the, the Supreme Court is gonna uphold the decision because if there's so much uh, precedent in, in copyright law. But my, my analogy is, suppose I wrote a book that had nothing to do with Harry Potter, but I put the cover for the Harry Potter book on it and put it on the shelf. And my argument was, and this is Google's argument, look, everybody loves Harry Potter. Everybody loves these APIs. So even though we rewrote everything in the inside, we just wanted them to see the Harry Potter cover because everybody loves Harry Potter. And I think if you use that analogy, you know there's something wrong with that. So that's, that's my take on it. I guess uh, next we've got Jeffrey Grazel. Is Jeffrey there? Hello? Okay, I don't know if Jeffrey's on mute or if he's left. We can go to Richard Cottle. Oh, is this? I talked to you, Richard. Okay, I talked to you already, right. Um, we have Rishi Singhal. Nope. Rishi, uh, Ruslan, I talked to you. We've got Robert Blinken. Oh, Robert Blinken has no audio at this point. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure what happened. Okay, well, I think, um, sorry, Rishi is having some audio difficulties. Everyone, I thank you for being on the call. You can always email me with other questions and uh, I'm glad to, to know that I've been helpful. Thank you very much. I'll end the meeting.